choose to participate or not. Okay, today we are going to be talking about chapter 19 out of the book. I'll bring it up, and uh, right here it is, chapter 19. We're going to be talking about it kind of in reverse order because I want you to get the, the, the stuff that I'm doing today, and then we're going to come back and do the first part of this chapter. So this is the chapter we're going to be talking about, programming the PID algorithm. And uh, I, I want to talk just a little bit about um, the, uh, the, the, the process of, of working with the process, but I want to give you some example of, of experiences. How do you want to say it any other way? I want to tell you some of the goofs and things that I've done, and uh, good, bad, or indifferent. And I keep waking up in the middle of the night trying to think, you know, should I talk about this, or should I talk about that, or should I talk about, and I, I, it's driving me nuts. So basically, one of these days you come in and you'll see this guy's got no hair left, and that's because I have totally gone bonkers with this course. Um, so anyway, uh, there's two, two expressions, P-I-D and P and I-D. Now, what's the difference between those two? This is an algorithm. This is a process drawing. You or somebody in your organization will come up with P and ID drawings. You'll sit there, you'll argue, you'll fight, you'll this, you'll that, you'll whatever. The last part of that book that I just passed around, the process book, not the instrument book, but the process book, is full of P and ID drawings, okay? If you wanted to build a control process for extracting blah, blah, blah from whatever, you can look and dial up in the back of that book, the last part of that book, and you'll see example problems or example solutions for specific areas. And you can look at and you can get ideas for how to control certain areas. Now, who are the prominent people? Who are the people who do this the, the most? Chemical engineers, right? Chemical engineers. Did anybody ever hear what the difference between a chemist and a chemical engineer was? Any ideas? What's the difference? About $50,000 a year. That's the truth. Okay, <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's a joke, but that's okay, don't worry about it. Don't be offended if your dad or your mom is a chemist instead of a chemical engineer. But chemical engineers are usually the people that come up with these. They don't have to be. Mechanical engineers can come up with these as well. Mostly electrical engineers do not come up with these, so you can probably be the person that would be asked to, to draw a PNID, or maybe the chemical engineer in your facility might be the person, but you may talk to them. You might be the person who actually draws this drawing up. You say, what are you talking about, sir? This is not something that I've ever been trained to do. Well, chapter 19 does a swag. It, it tries to get you to thinking about how to do a PNID. And in the back of this chapter, there is the rules of the road. For in other words, how do you, how do you put the the symbology together. Well, there's some, there's some, uh, in the back of this chapter, there is some rules that we, we talk about that, that get you to a, to a point where you can actually do that. Okay. So I, I don't want to, I don't impress you with that right now, but that's, that's the, that's the part that, um, uh, you, and, and this chapter it has a lot of good stuff in it. Uh, some of the parts and pieces are in the lab book chapter. Some of the parts and pieces are in the lab experiments in 44, PET 4450. So this stuff is scattered all over the place. It's not, one place does not contain all of the parts and pieces. And I tried to, try to do a good job with being fair between Alan Bradley and Siemens, but most of my work has been with Siemens over the last few years because I'll tell you why. It, it was, 
for quite a few years, I only did the Ellen Bradley, and I didn't even have the Siemens available. But when I was over at the other campus, we, we had a valve on a wall, and it's pictured here in this chapter, but it was beautiful. And when I came over, when we moved over from the other campus to here, I told them I wanted two, so they gave me two. And it was in 2350, and the first day that we ran that process, I, I was running it, and then the other guy ran it, and we, st and we stopped. We are just sitting there talking. The guy came upstairs and said, you been playing with water? Yeah, we did. There was a waterfall that went into one of the rooms downstairs. So basically what happened was the, yeah, the, the drain in that room went down, but then it went, it went horizontal for a ways. So that, thank you. So that, that, that room, that drain did not go straight down to the, to the floor below. We were assured that that drain is a three inch drain. It went straight down to a four inch drain. Nothing can go wrong, can it? Well, it did. So basically what happened was the water came down, went across, came back up, and went back up, and it filled this room over here with water. <laughs> so 90 gallons a minute is pretty sufficient to run anything ragged. So they were having a waterfall in another room, and we, we found that out. Well, then it happened again, and then they said, okay, then we, they, they tried to rotor root this thing out. So anyway, this is supposed to go down to whatever. But anyway, they rotor rooted it out, and they said, it's okay. And then we tried it a third time. The third time, it did it again, but I was wary of it, and I didn't run it very long, and then when it did it, I shut it down. So basically, the valve on the wall became historical, and we eventually took it off the wall because in spite of the fact that you know, it looks nice and all that kind of stuff. The only remnants of that are those two basins that are in that room, the two, the two water basins. And you probably wonder where those, where those came from. That's where they came from. So anyway, it was a beautiful lab. It worked very, 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 very well. And um, I, I loved it. You could sit there, and if you didn't tune it well, the thing would sound like a, it, it was going to rattle the wall. It would go, <laughs> It would rattle the wall like crazy. And you could say, that's not well tuned. And then you could turn the, take the number that was in there and just change it a little bit and it brought it back into being well tuned. So believe it or not, the, the proportional term, if it was 0.4, it worked perfect. If it was above 0.8, it started to go bonkers. So you could hear it and it was like, that's all it took, that's all it took. Anyway, so these are the, the letters that are, that are in those bubbles, the, those are those bubbles that are on a PNID, and these are what they mean, okay? So I listed those, those letters, and that's in, chapter, that's in chapter 19, page 83, page 84, page 85. And, and basically, you don't have to memorize them. They're pretty logical. They're pretty logical because F stands for flow. Uh, I is current. L stands for level. Uh, other ones, there's some good ones in here. S stands for speed. T stands for temperature. These are basic... Uh, items that you would expect, okay? So that is from Instrument Society of America, okay? Now called the International Society of Automation, but it's ISA. And by the way, if you are interested in joining an organization, put on your resume, it's only $10 a year as a student. And I think you get a carryover at least of a year, so you can join that for at least one year, $10. After that, it costs $100 a year, but get your company to pay for it. If you want to, it's up to you. Now, you say, why not some other organization? Well, this organization kind of blends between electrical and mechanical. So you can kind of say, you can go into that organization and you can talk to people who are mostly electrical, you can talk to people who are most mechanical. It's kind of the blend of the two. This is the, the blend of the two. 
IEEE is for electrical people that are electrical nuts, and that's usually all they do. Uh, mechanical, uh, SME, whatever, I don't know what else you belong to, but if you belong to something and you want to kind of be in the between electrical and mechanical, ISA is the one. And ISA, of all the organizations that are still out there, it's one that is still active in Toledo. You say, why are you saying that? Well, in the internet age, what? Most people do not belong to organizations. So the Detroit organization of ISA has disbanded. Toledo is still active. So there's a bunch of old guys that are my age that are in ISA, and there's some younger folk that are in ISA as well. They have regular meetings once a month. Costs 100 bucks once you, you know, after, after a while. Get your company to pay for it if you can. If you want to, it's up to you. I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but I'm telling you that it's, this is the one that runs this stuff, that does all this kind of thing. Okay, enough on ISA. So does everybody understand what a P&ID is? Okay. Now, they use P&IDs, use various components, like transmitters, like valves and all that kind of stuff. So you, you saw pictures in that, when you looked at the back of that, right, did you, did you look in the back part of the, of, the, of the process control book? Did you look in the back part of it? Did anybody venture back into the back part of this, this book? And did you see some P&IDs? Let me pass it around again. The last part of this book, if you want to know where your quiz question or your test question will come from for this, this part, it's out of this book, okay? I guarantee it. And it's the back part of this book. These are all P&IDs. This drawing right here is a P&ID. So every page you look at, there's another P&ID, okay? What does a P&ID tell you? It tells you how to control that process. And this is, that's what these are. Okay, I'll pass this around again. And you say, is this for real? It is for real, okay? So I was working on a project. This is a story that, it is a story, but it's a good one. I was working on a project for a company here locally, and I had previously worked on um, glass furnaces. So I was pretty good at knowing how to control a glass furnace for temperature. So they asked me, can you control a steel furnace for temperature? No problem, They're the same thing, right? They, they did the same thing. So they gave me this description, and it was just a short description, it was not a P and ID, and they said the word cross-limiting. So the word cross-limiting doesn't mean, how many, if I said the word cross-limiting, what would that mean to you? Cross-limiting, what does that mean? In a, in a steel heat process, what would that mean to you? It means the same thing to me, I had no clue. Okay, near a clue. But I'm supposed to write the programs for these, right? I'm supposed to write these programs. So, I'm, and, and this sounds like, you know, you're on your deathbed or whatever. I just got served papers for getting a divorce. Okay, you get the picture, this is not a good time in my life. I had trying to make as much money as I could because I was trying to keep my finances and my other finances still Okay, when you split your income in half, you understand what that does. It does, it does wonders. So I was trying to make enough money, in, in addition to teaching, to actually keep my boat afloat. So anyway, <laughs> all this was going on. So I go up to Algoma, to the steel plant in, in Sault Ste. Marie, and they were talking about cross-limiting. And I had purchased this book. I had just, because I had no idea, but I knew that this book existed. And I got back and it was at my place. And I looked in the index for the word cross-limiting. There it was, there was a picture. I took the picture in, the P and ID of cross-limiting to the guy who was my supervisor or who should have known what was going on. And I said, is this what you want? He said, yes. I said, I can program that. So if you look at, at the index of that book and you say, you see the word cross-limiting, and you look at the picture and you say, could you program from that and make that work? Yes, you could. Now, this was a company here that's gone out of business and, and they, were, they were a decent company. They just did not, they were, they were slowly going out of business, okay? You could just tell that things were, 
things were not as good as they were. The, the, and you come back and I, I visited them in in '98. I visited them again in. Um, I, I went. I did a little. This job was in '98. That's the that's the last part of '98. 1998 was when this job was done. I came back and worked for them in 2004, 2005, and then I came back and worked for them again in 2007, 2008. Each time I came back, they were smaller and they were smaller and they were smaller. And you knew they were going to have a business. But anyway, that's beside the point. Sad. What am I trying to say? The reason that they wanted me to write this was because they couldn't afford the, uh, the large company that had quoted a, a quarter of a million dollars to write the programs. That's, what, that's why they wanted me to do that. So that's why I got that job. Anyway, beside the point. So what saved me was that picture, okay? The picture of the PNID, that, what was cross-limiting. Now in this chapter, I actually talk about cross-limiting, and that's not the purpose of today's lecture, but I want you to understand that the term spurred me to be able to figure out how to write the programs, okay? So the term spurred me to get to the picture, which spurred me to write the program. So that's what that was. And I went back in 2004 and I talked about the same thing that they talked about. And I said, we're, we're, we're now, we, we, we've graduated from single cross-limiting, we're now a double cross-limiting. Fantastic. <laughs> you had nothing when I started and I helped you to get to the point where you actually got the cross-limiting, whatever. Anyway, it's beside the point. So the word cross-limiting has nothing to do with this lecture other than the fact that it spurred it, it, it got me going on that on that project, okay? That makes sense. It got me going. It's what, it's what saved me from having to go back to him and say, I can't do this because I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, so, so you got this P and ID, right? Okay, so there's several P and ID pictured in this, in this, um, in this chapter, and I'm gonna go back at the end of the chapter, and I'm gonna show you some of the examples, okay? So here are some of them. Here's another one. Here's another one. That's a, that's a big one, that's a big, massive one. Here's another one, okay? So at the end of this chapter, I have some examples. By the way, if you wanna do a PNID, uh, Visio supports it. Visio is what? It's the graphical, uh, it's the graphical uh, pictorial diagram for um, Microsoft. So if you want to do a PNID, one of the ways you can do it is Visio. It's not the only way, but Visio supports these pictures. So if you are interested in doing your own PNIDs, which I was kind of interested because that's, I needed to be able to draw these things, right? Visio is one of the ways you can do that. And it's not the only way, but it's one of the, it's one of the ways. Now there are better ways that you can pay more money for but Visio is one of the, the cheap ways to, to, that shows you the various pictorials and all that kind of stuff, okay? So Visio does that. It does it pretty well, really. So here's a, here's a problem, okay? This would be a problem like what would be on a test. So how would you write this in PLC lingo, okay? P and ID, I want, to, I want to write a program that actually does that, okay? Now you say, you're gonna tell me all the parts and pieces in order to do that. The first part is to just write the program in auto, and that's all that I'm expecting you to do, okay? Writing the program in auto mode only. That's the first step. That's the first step. Getting the program to run in auto mode only. Okay? So what do you look for? What are the rules of the road? Well, here's Ted's rules. Okay? These are my rules, but they work. Okay? You look for the IC or the RC. Something IC or something RC. Now, what are these things? This means a controller, this means a PID algorithm. So the word controller means a PID block. Okay, very simple. It's a big fat block in your program called P 
P-I-D. Okay? So if you see the word, if you see the letter C, third letter C, you're in. Okay? Make sense? That's the clue. So here I have how many of those? I have two of those. I have a FIC and an FIC. Now, they always number these, so they would you would in in essence, you would have to number these FIC 101 and FIC what? 102? Something like that. Okay? So you really have to do that first. So you've got two of these over here. Okay, now, what comes into a PID block and what goes out of a PID block, okay? There are a number of things that come in, but if you look at the simplest PID block that you could have, there is a process variable and a set point. And the output is called the out, or some people call it the CV, control variable, okay? Those are the three. So you're looking for those things on this drawing. And you're trying to figure out what the heck they are, okay? Now, what goes into a FIC? Oh, by the way, what does FIC stand for? FIC, Flow Indicator Controller. Now, what would be the I? The I would be the indicator, which would be what? That would be, that the I is, I stands for indicator. What would that mean? That means a faceplate. That means something that an operator can come up and look at and change and all that kind of stuff. Now, remember the other day I, t I showed you those, the, the graphic for those the physical, like the, remember chapter 15? <laughs> I showed you what, the person would be looking at and those those physical bars and all that kind of stuff those would be a PID controller that then you click on and then it gives you the ability to go into auto or manual so we're talking about two different things we're talking about in auto only right now but you can take that PID controller to manual if you want to you can do that but you don't from the first picture but the first picture just shows you the what it's doing the second picture shows you the auto and the manual, and it shows you, the second picture shows you all this stuff. The first picture just shows you the output. What is it doing? And is it in, is it in control? Are we in control? It may, it, the first picture may just show you the, the, the PV, the PV and what the process variable, whether it's where it should be or not. If it should, it's where it should be, you're in, good, you're in good shape, okay? So everybody understand the game we're playing. We're trying to fill in two inputs and we're trying to fill in one output for these, okay? So in this case right here, we have an FT that goes to a FIC. The, the arrow kind of shows you the, the direction. Now it doesn't show you an arrow here, but a valve, is a valve an input device or an output device? What does a valve do? By the way, what is this? It's a picture of a valve, okay? Does that make sense? That's what that is, that's a picture of a valve. Now, where did you get that picture of a valve from? Well, I got that from the Visio pictures of various types of valves. You say, how did you know that was a valve? Well, it looks like a valve, <laughs> and there's the head of the valve, and that's what that is, okay? So if you question whether that's a valve or not, you go back to the Visio drawings and say, now let me see what those look like. That is a valve. Now, is a valve an input device or an output device? Output device. It's something that's control, controlling something, but that signal is coming from here. Now, what kind of a signal is that? I don't know. They're supposed to be able to tell from these little dashed lines. Dashed lines can either be electrical or pneumatic or other, but basically electrical, either electrical or air, okay? Now, I think this, is, this signal here is air, but I don't really care because I'm gonna control that with, a, with an electrical signal, okay? Whatever they, whatever they did 50, 60 years ago, I could blow this away in a heartbeat. I'm going to control it with air. I'm going to control it with electrical, okay? Electrical signal. Either 0 to 10 volts or 4 to 20 milliamps. 
which is better, 4 to 20 milliamps. Why is 4 to 20 your better approach to sending an analog signal? Because zero is invalid. Zero means you, you've actually, you, you've gone off the edge. Four is your zero, four is your minimum value. Four, meant, four means zero. Zero means you lost your power supply and shut down. Okay, so when you say four to 20 milliamp, you're actually scaling the zero at four milliamps and the 100% at 20 milliamps. And by doing current instead of voltage, if you have a twisted pair wire and you have it in an area where there is an electrical noise, the same voltage is applied to both wires. Okay, twisted pair, UTP, unshielded twisted pair wires. If you twist two wires together and, and you induce some noise, some noise into those wires, they both get the same noise at the same time. So the current doesn't change, the voltage changes, but the current doesn't change. Okay, so 4 to 20 milliamp current is your best chance of getting a signal from here to there without having noise. Now, what's better than that? Going up to the actual device with a coax cable and putting it in as, a, as, a, as, a, as an Ethernet cable. All right? So if you can hit it with an Ethernet cable, you win. But if you can't do that, 4 to 20, all right? So, and, and, and by the way, they're doing this wireless now. You say, what? These are wireless. These valves are wireless. You hit them with 110 volts, that's all you need. They're wireless. You, you actually transmit the signal from your computer to that wireless valve out there, and it, and it does whatever you tell it to do. And it does it very well, okay? So today, the picture is a little dated, but the idea is okay. Any questions? <laughs> We're wild today. We don't do things the way we used to do them, but that's your output device. This is your input device. And why the little square root sign? Well, the process variable that we have there is, is a flow. That's what that is, okay? <coughs> But how do you get flow? You take the square root of differential pressure. How do you know that? I just know that. Square root of differential pressure is proportional to flow. So if you take the differential pressure, which that's the sign of that, take the square root of it, the output is flow. You say, where did they do that square root at? They do it right in that device right there. You don't have to do that in your, I've never had to write, take the square root of the, the differential pressure and then come up with, I've never had to do that. Always the output of the devices that I've ever had are, and I've not done that many, but every one of them, the output was flow. Pre-calibrated, you buy the stupid thing and it's pre-calibrated, everything's there, it works in a drawer, calibrated for certain blah, 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 and there it is. So there's your, you get flow, but the actual device is a differential pressure switch, okay? So that's why the little signal, sometimes they put it in, sometimes they don't. But again, what is that doing? That's coming down here and that's coming to this FIC. So now I've given you what is going on with the PV, but what's the SP coming? Where's the SP coming from? Where is the SP coming from if you don't see two things coming into the, to the FIC? Any ideas? Operator. Where? I said no operator. Set yeah, it's setting, the, the set point is coming from the from the, from the panel, from the operator. Very good. Everybody see that? So if there's not two ends, one of them is implied to be coming from the panel, from the operator. So he comes up to the operator panel, he says, give me, give me so much flow, and that's what that does, okay? Now why is there this multiplication sign? Ah, that's a little bit of math you have to do, okay? And it's not a big deal, but what is this thing called? If you look down here, you say, it doesn't really have a name, but it is a primary and secondary flow. So this would be steam or whatever, and you get so much steam out here, and you get so much proportional down here. Well, what would that be? 
That's your multiplication of your, of your proportional term, okay? Now, where would that come from? That would come off of your panel as well. But if you may multiply this flow by a certain amount, there's your flow for your second one, okay? If you want twice the flow out of this one, you'd put the number 2 in there. If you wanted 0.5, if you wanted half the flow on this one, as that one, you'd put 0.5 in there. Okay? Any question about that? So you could, if you chose, and I would expect this in this situation, you have a multiply block. And that would have this FT 101, FT 101, by by a constant that would go to my FT 102, which is that, no, 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 I'm sorry, that's not right. This is my set point. This, this would be not, not my set point. This is my, uh, sorry about that. Got excited, got twisted around. That's my set point. For the second one, okay. So that's my set point. For the second one. So, FT one hundred one by a constant becomes my set point for my one hundred two. F I C. F F F I C Ted. One hundred two set point. And that's my set point for my second one. What's my PV for my second one? This one right here. This would be. This is my um, flow. That's my PV. My flow. This would be flow. This would be uh, flow 101. That would be my there, and this would be flow 102. It would be my my flow there. And my set point is this flow. This is that set point right there? Okay. Now, is this all the programming that you have to do? The answer is absolutely not. You have other things as well that you have to provide. But if you want to try this thing out and see if it works, this is all you have to do. This is it. So if you are the programmer, you program this part and get it running first, and then you add the other parts that you would need. And I'm never going to ask you the other parts that you would need, but I want to ask you this. Okay, I'm going to give you a picture from the back of that book. What about this one? Oh my goodness, would I ever give you something like that? I have. Scared people to death, drove them nuts. I decided not to do that again. <laughs> Here's another one. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I'll not do that one. You say, what are you gonna, wh which one are you going to ask? There's a hundred in the back of that book. Okay? You can, you, by the way, if somebody wants to borrow that book and look at them for a while to see what they, see what, to practice some more, they can. But anyway, so what do you do here? What's this one? What are we trying to do? Look at a PNID and translate that into a PID program. That's what I'm trying to get you to do today. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get you to think about. You say, we really don't know what a PID program does. I'm going to tell you that later. That's going to, that we're going to wind that into then the actual chapter itself. But this is kind of preliminary to the chapter. This is kind of starting without... You know, whatever. So basically, what is this one? I have given this on a test before. Okay, so how many? What is an FRC? Farce? Force? Wait, well, it's a controller. That means it's a PID controller. Okay, so you have to have a PID block. What does the R stand for? Recorder. So what does that mean? It means the same as you had before. You remember when I showed you that strip, that strip chart, that, that, the thing that continued to flow and that type of thing? That's what it used to mean. 
but it doesn't mean that anymore. It means you have a PID controller with a historical, historical data plot. Okay, that's what it means. So you can go back and you can look at what it did over the course of time and see what it's doing. So it's a historical data plotter, what it is. So that's just another feature of the PID on the HMI, okay? And if how, how deep you wanna go with the data is how big you want your database. So basically you have to have a database that's assigned, you know, like bloop, how big and how, how long you want to collect the data and all that kind of stuff. But that's all it is, okay? Now you can have a simple snapshot that it collects that information or less two minutes or less five minutes or whatever without worrying about the deep database. But if you want the deep database, then you have to go to the more expensive, the Alan Bradley have to go to the, the SE instead of the ME. With the other guy, you have to pay more money. So you have to basically, if you want that capability, you have to say, I want those data points over the last month, you have to pay for that. You have to pay for that in some kind, of, or you have to build it yourself in a, as a database. But that's what that's about. That's all that means, recording of the data, okay? Flow means flow, F means flow. So that's what that is. We're still talking about flow, okay? A lot of these are F flows. So what does this one do? What does this do? You know, that says something that I, I, I really don't want to get into today, but I will talk about it just a little bit. This has, this has implications with the um, cross-limiting, okay? So if you check the cross-limiting page in that book, it has a, that block in it. Does anybody have any idea what that does, LAG? What does that do? Well, one example of lag is sports talk radio or any kind of a talk radio program. So if you call into a program and then you get online and you get on air, what do they do? What if you wanted to use the F-bomb or something else? What, did they, what would they do? There's a lag between when you speak in and then when it goes on the air. Does everybody understand that? That's a five or 10 second lag. That gives the person, the, the, per, the producer or somebody the chance to push a button to cut you out before it actually makes it through to the, to the, to the broadcast. Does everybody understand that? Okay, that's a lag block. <laughs> okay, it goes through and it's lagged. Okay, now what's another lag block? You got a train going through a tunnel, okay? He starts in over here and he comes out over here. So basically, the lag is when you, when you see the car until you see it again. That's a lag block, okay? What else is a lag block? This is the one that is, now, now I'm gonna describe the one that is in the thing that I cross limiting in it. So this is now we're getting into the cross limiting. I don't really care about cross limiting, but I want you to understand that this has significance. This thing here, this, this thing called lag has significance, okay? So, you have a valve for gas. You have a valve for air. Or you might, if you want, instead of air, you could use oxygen. Now these two combined together form what? With a match, form heat. Okay? Everybody agree with that? Okay? Now, how much of each do you put in? You put in about 9.2 or 9.1 parts of air to one part of gas to get a clean burn, okay? If you go more than that, it is lean. If you go less than that, it is rich. Do everybody agree with that? Okay, everybody got that in there, okay? So now what you should say is this. I want to maintain that, I, I want to maintain that, that, that ratio, okay? Now, in the example of the steel 
in, in the example of this, in the example of glass, you don't care. Why? Because you're above the temperature at which natural gas will burn off on its own. In other words, 2100 degrees Fahrenheit is hot. And if you throw a little bit more gas in there, who cares? If you throw a little bit more air in there, who cares? You want to bring it back to that 9.1, I think it's 9.1, I'm not sure. Does anybody know? What's the, rate, what's the gas air ratio of, of, for a clean burn of natural gas? Okay, no? It's okay. 9.1, I think, 9.2 maybe, I'm just in that range. It's in that range, 9.1, 9.2. Do you see why chemistry is important, though? See why, you, see why you had to take a chemistry course? Okay. Anyway. By the way, the first time I did a project with heat, I was scared to death. This is when I got burned and all that kind of stuff. I told you about that, right? You got the, the burn on my hand and all that kind of stuff. Did I tell you about that? I got a bad burn. Anyway, it's besides the point. But I, I was really cognizant of everything that was going on, trying to be, you know, whatever. But the story about that was, that was before this other, the, the steel plant. So I did a gas plant, get a, did a gas line, or I did a glass line, and then I did a steel line. But the glass one, when I was starting it up, I had a guy that was with me who was, he had done these before, but he had only written for Alan Bradley, and they wanted this, this company wanted it in Modicon. So I had had Modicon experience, so they asked me to, to, to retranslate everything from, Modic, from Alan Bradley to Modicon, and that's what I did. So we were there, we were doing this, and as we started this thing up, how do you start up a glass furnace? Anybody ever think about that? They bring in a company called Hotshot. No lie, Hotshot. And these guys use manual controllers, single, single controllers that just sit there, and they monitor them 24-7. So they're just somebody just sitting there. And they gradually, gradually, gradually turn them up. Manual controllers just basically turning them up until it gets to 2,100 degrees. Okay? It takes about a week. And in that period of time, they built this thing out of brick, refractory brick. And then they hold it together with big steel rods. And you know what the engineers do? During that period of time, continually loosening these rods because they were, they were tight, and then as the thing heats up, it expands. So they're constantly turning these big nuts on. The nuts on those rods are this big, and they're cranking those around, and turning them, under, loosening the thing up so that it, you know, it will stay closed. But that's how that, that's how they build it. That's how it works. Unbelievable. That's what it, that's what they do. But anyway. At day X, hour X, each hour, whatever, they say, yeah, are you ready? And we say, we're ready. And they say, okay. They turn theirs off. We turn ours on. You have about a half an hour to get it, to get it up and running. You have about a half an hour to get it up and running. And that's how they do it. It's a slow process. But they turn theirs off, and you turn your automatic system on and let it rip. And that's what we did. That's how you do it. Hot shot. Okay, enough on that. But lag with steel, where as with gas, with glass, G-L-A-S-S, -S, you don't care. With steel, if you're below that point, if you're at a temperature where you're, where if you, if you have more gas than air in that ratio, it will pool. What does that pooled gas do? Kaboom, it will blow up, it'll burn, it'll, it'll actually boom. So there has never been until the one we did up at, up at Algoma that did not have, a, have a, a blow up or whatever. I don't know, they said after a few years, ours hadn't blown up yet, and I, I hope that it never did. I don't know, I really don't know, I wondered about that. But anyway, I felt really good about the fact that ours created, we had one of the best steel algorithms there was and we actually had it all working and when I left they were very happy they were making steel for caterpillar caterpillar blades that's what they were doing they were doing hardened caterpillar blades and they said they were some of the hardest steel they ever had they took the steel they took it to um, Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland 
and they shot at it with tanks. They shot at it, and they said it's some of the hardest steel for tank sites that they'd ever had as well. So I don't know. I'm just saying. Whatever. Anyway, lag. What does that mean? When you are static, you don't care. But when you start to change, in other words, when you go from one set point to another, which do you want to move first? If you're going down, which one do you want to go first? Guess. You want to lag the air. When you're going up, which one do you want to lag? Which one, if you're going, if you're, if you're increasing, which one do you, which one do you want to lag? You want to, in, you want to, in, you want to, if you're increasing, you want to lag the gas, and when you're decreasing, you want to lag the air. Okay, does that make sense? That's what cross limiting does. No biggie. But that's what I could not figure out until, now the other thing is, we've never talked about a lag block. How do you build a lag block? Can you build a lag block? If there's no such thing as a lag block in your PLC or whatever, how do you build a lag block? You've already, we've already talked about the instructions that you could build for a lag block. It's called a FIFO. Put something in, take something out. Just delay it. Okay, so if you said you wanted to have five second delay, you put a, a FIFO stack in, and you put it in the top, and when you put this, you put another one in, it, the next, it, this one goes down to here. And then it goes down to here. And every time you push one in, one goes out the bottom. So if you have 50 of these, and you have every, ten, every, every tenth of a second, you, you grab another one, you have a five second lag delay. So here is the value you use, the one that pops out the bottom. Here's the one you put in. It's a FIFO. So you actually had it, you, you just didn't know that you had it. The FIFO stack is, is a lag block. If you want to use it as a lag block, you may. Some, some process systems have a physical lag block. But I'm not saying that because I, I, I want you to be aware of the fact that you already had a lag block, which you, you probably never realized, but that's what that is. That's not a big deal, okay? So I'm not going to try to ever ask you to program that kind of a thing in, bless you, in this course. But I want you to understand that there's a lot of parts and pieces that you've already touched on that are that are already in this in this even in this little thing right here okay so that is a lag block and that's no big deal but that's where that's where the cross limiting comes in okay so how do you program this there's one PID control okay and that's the FRC so what are the rules there's a SP there's a PV and there is a CV or an output, okay? Now, where does the CV go? The CV goes to the, to the valve. That's easy, that's that guy right there. What is the PV? It's this right here. No, no, I'm, yes, that is my PV. That's my, that's my uh, signal of flow, okay? And that's that guy right there. That's, that's VA, VO. That's flow or V0. That's what that is right there. That's my PV. Now you say, so what is all this stuff? What is this? It's this equation right down here. See that? which came from where? Came from this, 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 all together here, and it got to this. So here is my VO prime. There's my set point, VO prime. What is VO prime? It's this. So how do you write this? You write this as a, either a, a calc block or whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a, this is a mathematical equation. See, how did they ever get this? I don't know. Some chemical engineer experimentally got that. 
Okay, so some chemical engineer actually worked on it and found this equation, come up with it, and it does this thing right here. The feed forward loop control based on equation blah, 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 and provided with a lag for dynamic compensation. There you go. So, somebody says, I want a feed forward loop control with lag for dynamic compensation. What would you do? Come back with this picture from that book and say, is this something like what you would, are expecting? Force them to either say yes or no, but at least you have some ideas, okay? You don't have to wonder about what it is. The, 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 the thing with cross-limiting, I was totally, I have no idea, okay? Okay, so again, I don't want to bore you with this stuff, but I do want you to understand that, that those are some examples. Now, we'll practice some more of those. On there, I have old tests, and I have an old test bank, and I have a bunch of those. So we'll practice some more of those. But I want you to understand that it's a hunt and peck to find the SP, the PV, and the CV. Okay. All right, now I'm going to go back, and I'm going to talk about the basics of this of this. What, what is expected in, so you've, you've all had a course in automatic controls, right? Everybody's had a course in automatic controls of some kind, right? Okay. Okay, so what are we doing with a PID controller? Well, we're taking a block and we're going to a this is this is blocks now we're taking and, and doing okay so we're taking a so this is a process okay here's my PID algorithm Now here is the summation block that you that you've seen before. And we're doing feedback. So this would be no, it's we're we're doing this we're doing a subtraction. We're doing um we're not doing summation. Yeah, we are doing we're doing summation. This is my set point. And this is my PV, and we're doing either SP minus PV, or we're doing PV minus SP. It's one or the other. We don't know which, but we're doing one or the other. And we're feeding this back, okay? Now, in this algorithm, we're doing an error. This is called the error. Error is equal to PV minus SP, okay? And in this algorithm, we're doing the following. We're doing a constant, K1, times the error plus a constant K2 times the integral of the error plus a constant K3 times the derivative of the error. That all is going on in there. Okay? Now, what is, what is the formula for the process. What is the mathematical equation for the process? We don't know. This is where we vary from V-A-R-Y from the theoretical course that you took. In the course that you took, you knew that you knew the mathematical components of this process. You knew you knew what you were doing here. We don't. Everybody got everybody agree with that? Everybody see that? We do not have to know. We just say we're going to slap this thing on front of it. And we're going to put K1, K2, and K3 in. And we're going to control it. Does that always work? 
No. Can, can it be made to work? Yes. This book proves it. That book would never have been written if we, if we couldn't do this and, and make, make product with, with, with that, with those, with, with using three variables. We, we can actually control most processes. Okay? And if you don't believe that, we have three labs upstairs in 2350 that you can try. And you can try any of them, and you're certainly welcome to it for one of your, two of your labs or whatever you want to do. But basically those labs are set up and the programs are given to you. So you can actually download a program, see it run at least to a point, and then maybe modify it a little bit. But the K1, K2, and K3 are given. You say, how did you find those? Well, we have an auto-tune function, which is what? It finds the best K1, K2, and K3 values. But if there's a caveat for the one that has the auto-tune feature, the Allen Bradley does not have an auto-tune feature. The Siemens does. But with the Siemens auto-tune feature, they have this caveat. It's for slow processes. Not guaranteed for anything faster than 0.3 seconds tuning the, the, the constant, okay? I'm going to tell you another little caveat, and this is not something that you need to memorize, but it is valuable, okay? So where do these things really exist most of the time? You have loop within a loop, okay? Now, you don't have loop within a loop within a loop most of the time, but you do have loops within loops, okay? And when I quit Owens Corning and came to work at the University of Toledo, the fellow who was teaching or had taught for years the EET4450, which is the class that I'm teaching now. But anyway, that was a long time ago, but his name is Charlie Taylor, and he said, all you have to convince them to do is interloop fast, Auto loop slow. What does that mean? One thing it means is the inner loop, the K1, K2 variables are sh probably bigger than they are for the outer loop. The other thing is fast and slow means how fast you actually execute them. So if you execute the outer loop once a second, you might want to execute the inner loop every third of a second or every tenth of a second. Okay? In a loop fast, I'll loop slow. That tends to make you very stable. If you do it the other way, it makes your process very unstable. With the ball and tube lab, if you take the D term out, ball and tube, it's one of the very few that the D term, the K3 term, the K3 term, Ted, if you take it out, if you, if you make it other than zero, if you force it to zero, you go unstable. So the K3 or the D term, the derivative term, if you take it out in the ball and tube, the ball starts to go unstable and it goes unstable and it goes stable, it go top to bottom on you. It, 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 it cannot be controlled. You say, what does that mean? There's something over here in this part of it that causes you to go unstable. What does that mean? It means that your poles and zeros are over in the right half side of the plane. Laplace, okay? But I don't have the Laplace equations, but I can tell you it went unstable because it just starts doing that, okay? Any questions? <laughs> Anybody still following me? Not all of them go unstable if you take out the D term. Most of them, the stable is all day long. You take the D term to zero, that, that doesn't matter. Every once in a while you find one that does. And this one does. So, that gives you an, ed an edge in being able to program, and to look at the programs that are already there, and you know, 
you can if you want to. My apologies on the Allen Bradley side because I wish I had some Allen Bradley PID algorithms that worked. I did, and the water system turned to mush on me. And I, I used to have it. I asked them very seriously when we start when we moved over here. I said, "Can you please put us on the first floor?" See where I got. I can create a flood. I know how to create a flood. I can certainly make the first floors wet, but I don't want to do that. One of the best floods we ever had. And by the way, if you're interested, when we were still running that lab, there was a, I, I was offering people 5% uh, of their grade if they did a YouTube video, and there was one group that did a YouTube video, and it became, it went viral. The guy, it was like in, in Oh, eight or no, maybe maybe ten or in that range. Maybe maybe no. It had to be after it had to be after 2012. It was maybe 2013, 2014. In that era, the guy put one in there. And if you if you still Google Siemens PID, um, you have Toledo. Uh, one of the one of the best videos that I've ever seen that that, that went viral on him. He, you know, he'd get about 5,000, 10,000 hits a year on that. That's not going really viral, but that's, that's pretty good. And that was a, 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 a YouTube video that was back in that era, okay? Uh, if you do the, um, the tank over tank one, you'll actually see an instability, and the instability is because we're running the inner loop and the outer loop at the same rate, once a second. If you wanted to change, if you wanted to do something to that one and make it so that it was more stable, you would actually be able to, um, if you wanted to, make the inner loop run at a faster rate. But if you do that, instead of going once a second, if you make it go at a third of a second or whatever, you're losing accuracy because we only have so many pulses per, it's the inner, inner loop is the uh, flow loop. So we only have so many pulses per second we have 343 pulses max per second. And if you, re if you decrease your, your scan, if you, if you go down to a third of a second or a fifth of a second, you're actually dividing that number by three or five. So you'd only, that would be your maximum number. So if you want accuracy of one part in 343, keep it at a second. If you want accuracy of one part in 80, Execute it five times a second. See what the, the, the play you get is you have to, you give up something to get something because we, we bought a cheap pulse tap. We, we, we bought a cheap flow meter. It wasn't cheap, but if you want to get real high accuracy, you buy one that gives you thousands of pulses per second. Okay, and we, we bought one that did 343 pulses per second, which is still good. Cost 150 bucks. That costs 100 dollars. Okay, but if you want to go up in in scale, you have to buy one with higher. higher. Anyway, that's it. Any questions about that? We're going to go back on Tuesday, and to the best of my ability, I'm going to go through chapter 19 from start to finish and explain to you auto and manual and all the parts and pieces that go along with that. So there's a lot more to this than what I just gave you. But what I gave you is the stuff that I will ask you on a test and we'll review this again. But I want you to understand that, that what I just told you about how to take a PNID and translate that into a very cryptic but yet first cut of a, of a program is very important. Okay? And I also want to tell you that once you crossed and can do that, if you can take a program and do that, you just increased your saleability by about 50%. Because there's two types of processes. One, one type is the flow and control of that flow process, and the other is pieces and parts, automotive, that type of thing, where you're, you're ones and zeros, banging parts around and making things happen with ones and zeros. And, and, and you're doing state diagrams with, with moving of parts and all that kind of stuff. And there are two different worlds. People either go into one or they go into the other, typically. Now, some facilities have both. Automotive plant over on Jeep, the Jeep plant, you say, that's just a pieces parts plant. 
except for the paint room. Paint room is all PID. Okay? And some people say, well, I'll go in there, but I'll do anything but go in the paint room. How do you spot a paint room? When you're driving by an automotive plant, where's the paint room at? It's where all those little stacks are coming out. 30 or 40 of those little stacks that are coming out, that's the paint room. They're trying to, get, they're trying to exhaust all those fumes. That's what they're doing. But that's where the PID is. That's where the PID is because they've got flows going in. Okay? And those paint flows determine the color of the car. And that, do, you care if those, do you care if those oscillate back and forth? <laughs> How many of you have driven a, a car that, that had wavy colors in it? You don't want that, do you? Nobody wants that. Everybody wants, everybody wants their car to look one color. And they would, you say, they wouldn't even do that, would they? No, they shouldn't. But I'm saying, if the PID algorithms are out of whack, that's what you get. You get wavy colors. You don't want that. You want a solid color. When you open a toothpaste, you want to have, you want those, those colors in there to be constant. You don't want to have a glob of white and then a glob of jello or jello, and then you don't, you don't want to go back and forth. You want to have it in constant. You want constant in things when you're, when you're buying things. And so just to, that's examples, but you want quality, flow. I've been told I'm never, I've never gone into the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the plant over, the, the, sun, the sun oil plant over on the east side where they, 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 they take petroleum and make it into, into gasoline, the refinery. I've never been in that plant, but I've been told that there's a flame that is burning outside, and when that flame is just barely burning, that's when you're doing your best making of gas. Okay? When it's way big, the flame is way big, they're not doing well. Or when it's off, they're not doing well. But when it's just barely burning, that's when they're making their best quality and their best profitability of gas, gasoline. Okay? So again, this is process. If you understand process and understand how to write PID programs and can do that well, you say, yeah, but they don't do it on PLCs. They do. And even if you learn it on a PLC, you can translate it to a DCS system. If that's what you want to talk about, you can talk about DCS systems all day long. But they do the same things the same basic way. And I'll explain to you on next Tuesday some of the differences between a PLC, DCS, a, a PLC PID and a DCS PID but they basically do the same thing. If you can do one, you can do the other. But you walk in and, and somebody says, well, can you write programs for, for, uh, for process? Well, I did one. That's all you need. I had a person, a student, that all he had done was that valve on the wall. That's all he had done, but he understood that concept. He took off and looked at the programs that I'd written for the Algoma program. I was getting out of the control business. I was getting out of it. And he took the programs that I wrote and he translated them himself and wrote the, all the things and he did it on a computer at Ledbetter. And they took those and they ran the second line up at Algoma off of what he had written. A student of mine, a student that had gone through, and that's all he did. He wrote the whole plant. He wrote all the out control algorithms for the whole thing, just from that one, from, from the, the experiences of chapter 19, he was able to take off and, and write everything. You say, can you do that? Yes, you can. There's nothing, that book <laughs> and the little tips that I'm giving you are all you need. And then, now, I'm not telling you that to set you up, but I'm telling you that because if you do have a little bit of an understanding if this is something that gets you, gets into you, you like it, it's a whole second career. It's not just pieces and parts. PLCs are pieces and parts. They're the, you know, the boom splat stuff and all that kind of thing. This is the other half. And it can be very lucrative. If you get into the, if you get into the oil business and move to Oklahoma, make your 250000 a year, I mean, I didn't say you have to move to Oklahoma to do that, but I'm saying that that's where the that's where a lot of that is. A process engineer in Oklahoma or, or Texas or whatever, or maybe Pennsylvania. I don't know. I don't know where the, all, the, all that stuff is at today. But I do know this. They're very lucrative. Because they're, they're dealing with energy, they're dealing with oil, they're dealing with gas, they're dealing with process control of stuff. It's very, 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 very lucrative. And any time when the company's making money, they tend to reward their personnel. And, um, I'm just saying, it's a whole, it opens you up to a whole di di different area as opposed to just pieces and parts. 
Maybe it's something you would want to think about. Any questions anybody's got? We're going to go through this chapter on Tuesday, and then we're going to have our pictures taken and smile. Take care. We'll see you.